Have you got a handbook yet? Some installed files.
Well, good morning all. Good morning and, uh, and welcome to our, our worship this morning. I'm looking around to any visitors. Visitors with us this morning? Peter, nice to have you, nice to have you visiting. Uh, welcome, welcome. Now, after our worship today, there is the Sacrament of Holy Communion for those who wish to remain for that, or alternatively, there's refreshments served outside the, the West Hall. That's the Sacrament of Communion following this service. Uh, other notices, the flowers in, in church today are from the wedding yesterday of Ward Anderson and Deirdre Hurley, the visitors to uh, the families, long-time visitors to Bermuda, and rather nicely they chose to get married here in, in Christchurch. So that was yesterday, half past four, it dried up just in time, <laughs> just, just, just in time. Uh, other notices, Messy Church is this coming Saturday, five o'clock with the theme, Feed My Sheep. So that's this Saturday, the 20th. And then looking further ahead, uh, Fabulous Friday, the 26th. That's a weekend Friday, and it's a Calypso theme, and it will feature the Bermuda School of Music Steel Pan Band. So that's uh, the 26th, a week, a week on Friday. That's at 6 o'clock. I've invited Cindy to preach uh, this, this morning. Um, she and Ron leave this coming week to head over to England where she will be gainfully employed by the Presbytery of England in her capacity as an ordained local minister and on a good number of Sundays will be conducting worship at the, at the uh, St Andrew's Church in, in Newcastle. So we wish you well in your time there, Cindy. And these are all our notices for this morning. So let us worship God and sing to his praise hymn 358, The Great Love of God is revealed in the sun, hymn 358. of the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise. We come with your whole church in heaven and on earth to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all life, a God who in love creates and who in love sustains, and who through your Holy Spirit seeks to guide us in the ways of truth and of life. O holy God, righteous and merciful, cleanse our minds and free our consciences from the things that divide us from you. For too easily we have shut our eyes to your glory, our minds to your truth, and our hearts to your spirit, which seeks to dwell within us. And yet is our desire to offer you worship and service in love. And so for our past wrongdoings we ask your forgiveness. Pardon and deliver us from all our sin the way in which we have harmed ourselves and harmed others, and indeed the very creation of which we are but a part. And as we ask your forgiveness, we ask also the forgiveness and the patience of those whom we have wronged or let down. Grant us then the assurance of that forgiveness that we might be freed from these faults and feelings of the past, and since all your paths are loving and sure, 
Guide us in the ways we should go, the ways we should live, and lead us to the very fullness of life, which is your desire for us and for all peoples. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So, nope, do we have any children in here today? I don't see any. So, all right, I want you to think about your inner child. <laughs> so, how many here are related to somebody else that's also sitting in church today? Not, not your spouse. So do you have aunts and uncles in here or um, cousins? Got some cousins in here? So I remember one time when we first moved to Bermuda, we were really lucky. I am blessed to have a family that comes in all different shades. We have a you know, mixed race family and I remember talking and we have our neighbors who I've known forever and ever who we call Aunt Wendy. She happens to be black and you know, and when my kids first came here, we started introducing them to people and so I would walk down the street and typically like Bermuda, you always saw a relative. So I would walk down and I said, this is your cousin Debbie and this is your Uncle Roddy, and this is your Auntie Debbie. And, and invariably, they were white, and they were black, they were light-skinned, they were dark-skinned, they were medium-skinned, and, and I kept introducing my kids to all these relatives that they didn't know. And then I went and brought my son to my workplace one day, and uh, I introduced him to my boss who happened to be this beautiful black woman. And he reaches up um, before he even said hello and he goes, are we related to her too? <laughs> and that's actually what uh, today's reading is all about because we can have biological families, but in God, we are all one family. We are all brothers and sisters, regardless of where we come from, regardless of our background, regardless of what we look like or who our family is, we are all one family together in God. And you know, that's actually a wonderful story because that's actually part of the Easter message is no longer are we separate and only re related to the people who we're biologically related to, we're related to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. So our children's hymn today is, I don't have it in front of me, 448. Shine Jesus, is it Shine Jesus? Shine Jesus, Shine. <laughs>
our scripture readings for today. We'll be reading from two different books of the Bible today. The first will be from Psalm 100, which you can find on page 552, 552 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter the gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. The second reading is from the letter of 1 John chapter three, verses one to seven. And that can be found on page 240 in the New Testament of the Pew Bible. From 1 John chapter three, verses one through seven. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Hymn 478. Behold, the amazing gift of love the Father has bestowed on us in 478.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. So we continue in this Easter season and looking at the early acts of and looking at the acts of the early church. And if you'll remember last week, we encountered the disciples in the locked upper room and Jesus appears to them. And then he breathed into them. You remember Alistair saying that our, our translation, he didn't breathe on them, he breathed into them. And it was the same verb that was used in Genesis at the very beginning when Genesis says, God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And Jesus breathing into the disciples gave them new life. And at that moment, the disciples recognized that the one who was crucified is indeed the presence of God in Jesus and importantly, in their lives. And it was not a one-time event. The scripture shares that the disciples experience and the experience is open to each one of us. We saw that in that he spoke to Thomas later and then even Paul much later who was not an original disciple but Paul's experience of the spirit was no less valid than that of the disciples and our experience of the spirit in our lives is no less valid than it was 2,000 years ago. It is ongoing, it is every day. And so what we're reading about today is what happens when we expect or when we accept and recognize the Spirit of God in our lives. In our baptism, we proclaim that it is Christ himself who baptizes us. By the Spirit of Pentecost, he makes us members of his body, the church, and calls us to share in his ministry in the world. And that's really the message of today's scripture. The gospel, the good news of Easter. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We are children of God. Our reading came today from a group of the Johannan letters, which um, were most likely written by one person, and he's identified in letters two and three as um, John the Elder. And most scholars believe that the first letter was also written by the same person because the style is similar, and um, there's lots to indicate that it's the same author. And the very first verse of the first letter indicates that this John was one of the original followers of Jesus, that he was an eyewitness to the life and resurrection of Jesus. And the author in these letters is addressing a schism that has come and taken place in the house churches for which he is um, responsible. And there are some members who no longer believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They no longer believed that he was actually human. They, they believed in um, a docetic idea that it was really God just impersonating a person, but he was really not really there. And this first letter is actually a sermon, and it's an encouragement to the members of these house churches to remain faithful to the truth and the transfer more formative powers of the Holy Spirit and the redemption of Jesus Christ through the cross. So I want you to each say to yourself, right now, I am a child of God. Now I want you to say it again and mean it. I am a child of God. So do you believe it? Do you believe it deep down inside, deep down to your core? If you do, it's an amazingly transformative concept when you in pull it deep down inside of you. You know, we hear all the time about this crisis that our teens are in around the world, this crisis of mental health at, that the youth are experiencing, but it's actually not just youth. Psychology 
today says that over 85% of adults struggle with low self-esteem. And you know, that affects a person's self-worth, their self-confidence, their self-love, their self-respect, and it also affects how you interact with other people in the world. So how many of us actually look in the mirror every day and what's looking back at us go, I love my wrinkles. I love my love handles. You know, I love my height. I love my, you know, whether I'm tall or short. I love my hair. I love me. We don't. We always find something wrong. But God loves us just the way we are. And that spiritual transformation that we have in our relationship to Jesus transforms us. We are able to say with confidence, I am a child of God. I am beloved of God, just as I am. But wait, you say, when you start to think about that, you go, hmm, honestly, I don't always act or think or maybe behave like a child of God. And as one commentator I read said, when we look into our hearts and honestly with fearless self-searching look at how we behave and act and do things, he says, we have to say a, a child of God? I don't think so. But accepting that we are a child of God is only possible, it's a truth that is impossible to believe apart from the gift of faith. Because it's through faith we can believe and trust and pull deep down into our core that yes, we are children of God. And the truth of the resurrected Christ is that God's love staked a claim on us that overwrites the truths that we think we know. We experience brokenness. We focus on our brokenness. But God's truth declares us whole. And when we accept the Spirit of God, just like the disciples did in those first days, we are adopted. In Romans 8, written by Paul, he says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. And, we cry, and in, by him we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies within our spirit that we are God's children. Today's passage is all about transformation. It is not a one-time event, but it's an ongoing growth and development. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed, but what we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And that's a very important spiritual point, a point in our spiritual journey. That of being and that of becoming. I truly believe all human beings are children of God. All the time. There is nothing we can do or believe or not do or not believe that can change the fundamental truth about each and every single one of us. However, being a child of God and living like a child of God are two different things. And God is not coercive. As Paul says, we don't live as slaves or in fear. We have the choice to accept or reject the spirit of God in our lives and our adoption as sons and daughters of God. But when by faith we accept the spirit of God in our lives, we can stop saying, not me, and instead utter a deeper and more profound truth, not yet complete, but yes, by the grace of God, I am God's own. And that's the Easter story. That's the Easter story in our, day, in our lives today, day in and day out. 
We are not complete. We have not yet appeared as our perfect selves, but we are already claimed, not complete, but begun. And that transformation in our lives by accepting our adoption as a child of God affects how we interact with the world and each other. When we recognize that not only we, but every other person is a child of God, it affects how we act, speak, behave, and just deal with each other. Just before today's passage that we read and just after today's passage, John the Elder reminds us that Jesus gave us a new commandment, to love God and love our neighbor. And John gave a specific example, he said, I am the light. No, whoever says I am the light while hating a brother or sister is still in darkness. But whoever loves a brother or sister abides in the light. As a child of God, we have a new family. Not a biological family, but a spiritual family. And we are linked to each and every other person as closely, possibly more closely, then we are linked to our biological brothers and sisters. In Jesus, we are invited to be one family. The gospel gives us a way to be in relationship with people we do not know and with people we do know. In, 19, um, in August 1963, Rabbi Joachim Prince marched um, participated in the fabulous March on Washington with Martin Luther King. And Rabbi Prince was trained in uh, Breslau. He was a Berlin-based rabbi until he had to flee Nazi Germany in 1937. And at the March on Washington, he said, when God created man, he created him as everybody's neighbor. Neighbor is not a geographic term. It is a moral concept. It means our collective responsibility for the preservation of man's dignity and integrity. Many of you will know the late Stephen Smith. He was the very first customer that we had at Loads of Love, our shower and laundry program. And he described his interaction with Christ Church Warwick and his acceptance as a member of the church family here in an interview that I conducted with him in 2012. And I'd like to read to you the transcript of that interview. Stephen said, I'm without a house, an apartment. There are a lot of us living outside. I thought the laundry was a great opportunity to freshen up, and that's all I came for. That's all I was thinking about when I first came to Christ Church. I had this feeling inside that God was trying to direct me to find a home. And I told him about it, and he said, why not? The pastor already feels that you're one of the flock anyway. I thought, really? Wow. Wow, that was awesome. I got sick. I get sick quite often through my diabetes. And one day I'm in the hospital and in walks the pastor. I was totally shocked. No one had ever visited me in the hospital before. And he came over to me and I said, are you sure you're here to see me? He said, of course I'm here to see you. Pat told us you were in the hospital. Wow, that was absolutely awesome. I cried. Every time I think about it, I cry, to tell you the truth. And just for reassurance, I'm listening to the Bermuda Broadcast Radio, and the verse of the week was, beautiful are the feet of those who carry the gospel. And I said, okay, God, you found me a home. You found me a home. Okay and I started coming to church, and it's absolutely awesome here. There's so much love in this church. It's uncanny there's so much love. 
wow, I need to heal. And God needed to put me somewhere so I can heal around God-fearing, God-loving, loving people that spread God's love. No matter where I am, and every time I come, I know I'm not homeless anymore, for sure. For home is where the love is, and I know I'm not homeless anymore. Stephen was a beloved child of God, and he found brothers and sisters at Christ Church, and it transformed him. When we accept our adoption as a child of God, we begin a transformation, a transformation to our perfect selves. Say again to yourself, I am a child of God. Now think how in faith, believing you are a child of God, you think about yourself. Ask yourself, how as a child of God do I see myself? As a child of God, do I believe that while I have faults, I am beloved by God? Now think, how believing that you are a child of God, you would interact with the world? How as a child of God do I interact with my neighbors, my work colleagues, my children, my family? How as a child of God do I drive my car or wait in line at the great grocery store? How as a child of God do I respond to a homeless person or react to someone I disagree with? If you think of those answers, you'll see what I mean. When we can accept by faith that we are sons and daughters of God, it is quite transformative. And that's the point. As John says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we have been, what has not been, what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. And that is the wonderful, living, good news, the gospel of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The gospel of Easter and the resurrection is that you are and I am a child of God. We are beloved of God, just as we are. And while the Spirit hasn't finished working with us, we are becoming our own perfect selves through faith and in the life of the Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of reflection is hymn number 510. Jesus calls us here to meet him. Hymn 510.
Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. O Lord our God, source and giver of all good things, we thank you for all your mercies and for your loving care over all creation. We bless you for the gift of life, for your protection around us, your guiding hand upon us, your steadfast love within us. We thank you for friendship and family love, for good hopes and precious memories, for the joys that enhance our life, but also the trials that teach us to trust in you. And most of all, we thank you for the saving knowledge of your Son, our Saviour, for the living presence of your Spirit, the Comforter, and for the Church, the Body of Christ, for the ministry of Word and Sacrament, and all the means of grace. In all these things, make us wise in the right use of your blessings, that we may offer an acceptable thanksgiving all the days of our life. And through Christ our Lord, we offer now our prayers for others. We pray for this, your world, a world sadly marked by war and terror and hatred. Especially this day, we look in horror the escalation of violence in the Middle East, of the long legacies of history and the bitterness that that has created. And we look too in horror at those who would wish to use war and violence and death itself as a means of righting past wrongs. Root out from people's hearts that hatred that so makes for war and suffering. And may it be replaced and overcome by your wisdom that may be a wisdom shared by the leaders of our nations and those who direct the ways of our world. So we pray for the leaders of all nations that they may be men and women of wisdom of integrity, of reconciliation, seeking to honour your glory and looking at ways of bringing peace where there is presently violence. And nearer to home, we pray for ourselves this day, reflecting on our own needs and asking for your blessing. For some, it's a time of excitement and anticipation for others, struggling a bit, looking for a way to a more wholesome life. Be with us all in our needs. And for those we love, our families and friends, wherever they may be, we ask for your blessing upon them. For we know that it's in our very midst there are those who are in need at this time, some through illness, others awaiting surgery, anxious, fearful. There are those who feel lonely, certainly without a sense of being at home. Those who have been bereaved and live with that sense of absence. For a moment in silence, we each bring to mind those whom we know and whom in the quiet we name before you as we ask your blessing upon them. The loving God, whatever their needs, bind up their wounds and bring them to fullness of life. We pray for those whose lives are so very different from our own this day 
While we live in the relative security of this island, there are those who have seen their lives devastated, destroyed by war in so many parts of your world. And those for whom today is a constant struggle against poverty and lack of food, clean water, and so many of the things that we take for granted. And so we commit ourselves to be people of reconciliation and people who work for a greater sense of justice and sharing in this your world. And in this Easter season, we pray for your church, the very body of Christ. Christ's eyes and ears and tongue and healing hands in this your world today. Christ's feet, who take us to places where we would perhaps rather not go. Enable your church in the world to be fully that body of Christ, which reflects your love for us and for others and indeed all creation. And we remember too, always those whose lives were shared with us, those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to receive, May we never think them far from us, for we share a fellowship, a communion with them still through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, and all our offerings of our time, our talents, and our resources, praying that to be symbols of our commitment to live in your ways and work for the signs and the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn, hymn 644. O Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end.
And now go in peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Thank you.